Hello and welcome to the Craft Beer Corner. For today's beer review, we're going to be jumping into a couple of IPAs, a um, couple new ones I've never had, one by a brewer I've never tried anything from, uh, so always exciting. Uh, starting up a brewer that we have gotten to know pretty well here, uh, Lupulin Brewing Company. This is called Sophistry. It's a standard IPA, 7% ABV. They are based in Big Lake, Minnesota. This one's been brewed with a blend of Citra, Yukino Cryo, Rakao, Galaxy, and Falconer's Flight Hops. So a really stacked and uh, interesting hop blend there. Uh, moving on to number two today. First time I've ever had a beer by them. It's, um, I don't know if they pronounce it Stellwagen or Stellwagen, like it's German, W-A-G-E-N. Uh, but anyway, I'm gonna go with German Stellwagen Brew Company. Uh, this is called We Are Your Oat Verlords. Um, this is an oat IPA. This one also clocks in at 7% ABV. They're based in Marshfield, Massachusetts. Now this specific beer, kind of interesting. They brewed with Citra, Eldorado, and Rakao. Rakao is not uh, a super common uh, hop to be thrown around even in the craft beer scene, though I have seen it start to creep in a lot more often. So we're sharing uh, two of the same hops in both of these beers, the five hops versus three hops. And uh, once we dig a little deeper into this one in the review, I'll tell you a little bit more about this one. Uh, but they both sound great. I can't wait to jump in. So we're gonna get started with the Lupulin Brewing Company's Sophistry. This one clocks in at 7% ABV. Okay, so jumping into the first beer of today's IPA review, we have got Lupulin Brewing Company's Sophistry. Standard IPA 7% on this one. They're based in Big Lake, Minnesota, and this one's been brewed with a blend of Citra, Yukino Cryo, Rakao, Galaxy, and Falconer's Flight Hops. So five different hops, a uh, really nice bill there. Uh, some little higher alpha acid content than others, but all higher than your typical, say, Fuggle or Nibble Hop strains. Um, may as well mention it since they put it on the back. They say 65 IBUs on this. We've talked about this many times. Today uh, will be no exception. IBUs is the actual measurement of the international bitterness units. That's what it stands for, which is how bitter the beer is. And it runs on a scale. It doesn't necessarily mean this is going to be super bitter or very weak on bitters. It's all about perception. So in and of itself, it's kind of meaningless. It's how it's all put together and it really varies person to person. But let's start with the label art on this. Um, typical Lupulin Brewing, they've got their hop cone little thing on there and it's nice. It's very clean design. I really like it a lot. Nice shade of purple with this uh, bright yellow hop that they put on their design. So let's just get this one cracked, poured right in the glass. And while I'm doing that, as you may have come to expect by now, I should tell you I did indeed secure both beers from Tavor. So yet again, Tavor coming through for me with some excellent choices. All right, as I'm pouring this, this is looking a nice, true, deep golden color, golden yellow. Looks very, very nice. Looks like it's forming a pretty good head here too. I'm gonna have to back off, give that a chance to do its thing. Let's hold this up. Uh, this is not a hazy insofar as I can tell. It looks quite clear. It is a very deep, deep golden yellowish color. Um, maybe a little deeper than I expected, but it's very lovely. It uh, certainly looks like a nice IPA formed an absolutely crazy head. Just a crazy head here. Um, let's get down for a sniff. Oh yeah. Yeah, it smells really, really nice. So. The first thing that jumped out at me when I was smelling on this, even though it's got Citra and all these other blends in there, the first hop characteristic aroma that came through was earthy. I picked up more earthy than anything else and then I picked up a little tropical fruit behind that and then I started to smell a little citrus. I don't really smell anything in there that smells very resinous, very pine-like, and I don't really get anything in there that smells, um, kind of floral, as, as I would describe. It's, it's this really nice mix of tropical fruit, citrus, and earthy hops. That's what's coming through on the nose anyway. Um, so yeah, this did form quite a big head. I'm just gonna try to break that down just a little bit so I don't have to wait to jump in. I'm not gonna go too crazy, just give it a chance to sell itself out, pop some of those bubbles. If I gave it another minute, I'm sure it would be settled significantly more, but we're just gonna jump right in. So without further ado, Get a mess in our beard. Oh. 
Oh yeah, that's a nice IPA. Okay, so before I even say anything else, as I mentioned before, I even jumped in this 65 IPUs, it's all about perception. To me, this is a very mildly hopped IPA. This one tastes like it's a lot more about the balance of hop flavors and characteristics and aromas they're bringing to the table, which is fine, sure. Do I prefer more bitters in my IPAs? Yes, I do. But is this tasty? You bet it is. You bet it is. So, aroma doesn't necessarily translate into flavor profile in any beer, let alone an IPA. In this case, there are some elements that I picked up on the nose that are translating directly to the palate. So, there is this subtle earthiness to it, and there is most definitely a little bit of a citrus quality to it. And indeed, I am tasting some kind of tropical fruit notes in there. Now, interestingly, while I didn't detect any of this whatsoever on the nose, uh, there is a little bit of a resinous quality to this one. It, um, I don't know if I would call it pine per se, but it's definitely resinous. It's kind of tar-like. It's in the same family as pine, but it's not as astringent as pine. Maybe more akin to cedar or something like that. But yeah, it's it's got a lot of different characteristics. And I can tell you, while they're not intense on the bitter, bitter side at all for my perception, they are very big in terms of flavor. And the balance of the flavor is really, really quite nice. It's a very, very well done, very tasty IPA. I'm gonna top this one off just a little bit more now that that head settled down a bit. It's holding true though. And uh, let's jump in for body and mouthfeel, flavor development and finish. Body on this one is a solid medium, medium heavy. It's got a lot more robust presence to it really than I anticipated for just a 7% standard IPA which is really kind of right in the Goldilocks zone for a standard IPA, 7%. And um, honestly, yeah, it does. Has a lot more breadth to it than I expected. It's a lot bigger on the palate than you would anticipate for that range. Mouthfeel, classic IPA. There's nothing funky about the way it feels on the palate. It does have a good bit of resistance to it as well. The mouthfeel is a lot more resistant than your average IPA. It's got a little thickness and a little weight to it. When you agitate around the palate, this one does get a good bit creamier. I wouldn't call it silky, but it does get creamier and kind of adds to that perception of thickness. In terms of how the flavors kind of develop and how they finish out, really everything kind of comes in layers. You pick one out and then the next one kind of comes in and the next one kind of comes in. And then a few other bits and pieces and your brain is just trying to process everything that you're tasting. I stand by, there's the subtle earthiness, then kind of tropical, kind of notes come through, then there's some citrus that comes through, and then it's really on the back end where this leering kind of resinous quality. I said akin to like pine or cedar, leaning more towards cedar, but yeah, this almost sap-like, just this resinous quality to it, which I didn't pick up in the aroma, but yeah, it does come through quite clearly, and it is predominantly on the back of the palate. Now, in terms of how long this finish is, the finish is not super long, but considering the overall lack of at least my perceived bitterness in this one, um, the, the length of the finish is actually quite a bit longer than I did anticipate, to be certain. And it's really that lingering kind of resinous hop quality that's really extending this one out far longer than I anticipated. It's not top tier, but it's not really off the mark by that much. It's a very, very nice beer very well put together, very flav flavorful, very aromatic, looks the part, tastes the part. I'm a big, big fan of this one. I'm gonna take my time, sip on this, count my scores. When we come back, we will get to the second beer of today's IPA review. That is Stellwagen Beer Company's We Are Your Oat for Lords, an oat IPA that clocks in at 7% ABV. Okay, now jumping into the second beer of today's IPA review, we've got Stellwagen Beer Company's We Are Your Oat Verlords. This is an oat IPA, 7% ABV. They're based in Marshfield, Massachusetts. This one, a three hop blend, shares two from the, from the first one we just reviewed. That's the Citra and the Raquel. And then the third is El Dorado. So another interesting hop blend here. Uh, Raquel is not a hop that you see a lot, but in the past year, year and a half, I have seen a lot more uh, specifically IPAs coming out with this hop variety in it. Um, so 
I did mention, uh, obviously there's uh, something I'm gonna get to about this beer. First thing though, it's an oat IPA. So what is an oat IPA? It's exactly what it sounds like. It's an IPA that's also been brewed with oats. Typically it's gonna be flaked oats, which is different than the kind you would make cereal. Those are rolled oats. Flaked oats are from the same part of the grain. It's just uh, the flakes. They're not milled through a machine. So it's just raw flaked oats. Um, Certainly you could make food out of it, though it would be a bit uh, on the branny side of things. Uh, so it's not too dissimilar to say an oat wine. We've reviewed a few different oat wines on here. Same thing, it's just flaked oats. They brewed it with flaked oats. And obviously everybody knows oatmeal stouts. Well, what do they mean when they say oatmeal stout? They're talking about the flaked oats. They didn't actually use oatmeal, but more or less the same thing. Just typically oatmeal, you're gonna have rolled oats. It's flaked oats that have been machined and rolled, rolled out and processed. So. Oats kind of are going to do the same thing in any beer style. One, it absolutely is the single best ingredient you can add to any beer if you're uh, trying to get a really nice head. It aids with head formation and retention. That is a fact. Um, what else does an oat do? It typically adds a little bit of underlying sweetness um, as a rule. Doesn't always, but that's the typical what comes through in a beer. And the other kind of main side effect it does is it does typically add a bit more thickness to the mouthfeel. Sometimes it can add a little breadth to the body, but it's much more a mouthfeel thing. It, it is gonna feel a little more voluminous. Um, so what's the interesting trait for this beer, aside from the fact that it's an IPA brewed with oats? Well, this has been brewed with a very specific type of yeast and it's Kaviek yeast. That's a K-V-I-E-K, K-V-I-E-K. Kaviak. Um, that is a specific Norwegian dialect. All it means is yeast. Now, the standard word for yeast in Norwegian is pronounced yar, and if you spelled it in English, it's G J, and then it's got an A with an E kind of smushed into the side of it. So it's almost like it's one letter, but it's an A E smushed R. So uh, G J A E R, but it, the A E are smushed together. Um, Norwegian has some interesting, unique characters that are all still based on uh, our um, Latin alphabet. But at any rate, that's the difference. So this is Kaviak, um, which is the dialect, which means yeast. And what is that exactly? Well, it's a Norwegian yeast that's cultivated. It's cultivated yeast. So it's quite different than, say, a Belgian lambic beer where there's wild yeast or like a farmhouse ale where there's wild yeast letting it do a thing or like the wild yeast you would use to cultivate a sourdough starter. Completely different. Um, this is not wild. This has been cultivated over time, so it's like an already bred uh, yeast strain that's just been kept alive. In that sense, it's not dissimilar to sourdough, except there's nothing wild about it. They're not leaving it out to the elements and capturing what comes into it, so it's been honed down. This is the specific type of yeast. That's all that that means. So, Ought to be a relatively interesting beer drinking experience. IPA that's got oat, and then they're using Kavia yeast as well, which is a very unique and particular kind of flavor profile that it brings to a beer. Um, but nonetheless, let's check out their label art. Uh, we are your oat verlords. They've got kind of a Viking thing going on on there. That's uh, obviously the nod to the Kavia yeast in there. And I like it, it's kitschy, it's a nice play on words. So let's get this cracked, gently. All right, and poured right in the old glass here. All right, nice pale yellow. Yeah, that oat's really gonna get my head going here. Probably a little crazier than the last one did. Yep, I'm gonna have to let that settle for just a bit. Obviously, um, I kind of expected it would form quite a big luscious head. Uh, one other thing I can say, uh, this is cloudy. You could call this as a hazy IPA if you want, but I don't know as though they actually intended to brew a hazy New England style. I highly doubt it. That's gonna be caused by the oats. Uh, oats, as a rule, are gonna cloud up a beer. Now, the beer styles, you most commonly see it. You can see it in oat wines, obviously, kind of a side shoot of a barley wine, um, but you'll also see it, obviously, most people know it from oatmeal stouts. Um, yes, if you actually were able to see beyond the depth of color of a stout, you would notice that they do look occluded. That is from the oats. Um, so it probably really has nothing to do with them making an oat-based version of a New England style. I doubt that's the case, just based on what they put together. 
that's just strictly a byproduct of the fact that there's oats in here. That's what it does. So looking at it, obviously, I'm going to have to settle that head down a little bit. In fact, before I even sniff it, I'm going to break it down just a little bit, get that started. It's also going to give me a better shot at picking up more aromas since that head's so absolutely lush and creamy and thick on here. Let's give it a proper sniff. Ooh, yeah, that smells quite nice. So not, not a completely dissimilar aroma to what I got on the first beer. Uh, but the first thing I got on this was the citrusy side from the Citra. This specific, in this specific beer, the way that it's coming off to me, it's kind of a blend of oranges, limes, lemons, and a little bit of grapefruit, but it's much more standard citrus, orange, lemon, lime. It's kind of a blend of that. Again, what I'm getting in here, there's a lot of earthiness to it. Now, that's not an aroma you pick up a lot in a lot of commonly used strains in craft IPAs. I am guessing that that's coming from the Rakao. I haven't had enough exposure to it or had a single hop version, but I would suspect that that is one of the flavor and aroma elements that's coming through. So it's probably a little higher um, alpha acid content hop variety that shares kind of like a British Fuggle Hop. I know that's the one I always use as my de facto. That, for my money, is the single best way to uh, let somebody understand what I mean by an earthy hop presence, both aroma and flavor. The Fuggle Hop is kind of top dog for that characteristic for my money. But I'm picking a lot of citrus and a lot of earthy out of here. A little bit of tropical fruit that might be coming from a cross between the Citra, the Rakao, and the Eldorado. It could be coming from a mix of all three. Really no hint of resin in this one. Really no floral hints whatsoever. It's dominant earth and uh, dominant citrus with just a little bit of tropical fruit in the back. But suffice to say, it smells very, very nice. That head settled down once I kind of broke it down. I'm going to pour a little more gently so that oat doesn't do its thing out of control on me here. Okay? So without further ado, we're going to jump right in and see what this one's about. Mmm. Oh. Oh, that's very tasty. Okay. Right away, a completely different beer drinking experience from the first beer. And it's unique in a lot of different ways. And obviously, they added oats, they added caviac yeast. And that is absolutely kind of the hallmarks of what this IPA is about. That's the cornerstone. It's an IPA at heart, but they threw it up on its head and just went big. Very interesting combination of ingredients, but I gotta say, it absolutely works. It absolutely works. Kaviak is obviously not a yeast that you would commonly find in an IPA bill. But let me tell you, it's nice. Kaviak has this slight tanginess to it. You could say it's got a little bit of funk and a little bit of sour, but it's not what I would call super funky or super sour. Elements of it remind me of baked goods, but it's very yeasty. It's got a very yeasty flavor. Not dissimilar to a yeast bread or the way that even fermenting sourdough smells like. It's got this distinct yeastiness to it, but the elements do remind me much more, at least in thinking in terms of beer, how kind of a sourdough yeast starter that you're getting going kind of smells like. So it's got a lot of these elements in it. There's some funk, there's some earthiness, there's some sourness to it, a little bit of tartness, but there's definitely this overarching kind of yeasty quality about it. It reeks of yeast. I mean that in a good way, um, both uh, um, in terms of pungency and just the overall flavor. So it's got a lot of hidden elements and that's all due entirely to that Kaviak yeast strain that they use, that Norwegian cultivated yeast. In terms of what the oats are bringing to the table, they're definitely adding, as I expected, and I caught it on first sip as I was agitating and swallowing, it's definitely added not just to this head retention and formation, but also added to this mouthfeel. So it's pretty much exactly what I expected it would, but it's an IPA form, and this one does have a bigger, bitter profile to it. So you're getting all of these other interesting layered characteristics, but with a little bigger sense of bitters in it, and it's very, very nice. It's very, very enjoyable, well put together beer. Um, I'm going to jump in, really scrutinize here the body and the mouthfeel, the flavor development, and the finish. But so far, on first sip, this one's a winner. Let's jump back in. Oh. 
The body on this one's not over the top. It doesn't have a ton of breath, but it feels exactly what I would expect for a 7% IPA. It's a solid medium. It's a strong medium. That's what I would expect. It's really more the mouthfeel um, that's uh, a, a little bit more substantive than one might expect for the style and the ABV, and really that does come back to the oats. There's a lot more resistance. It feels quite a bit thicker on the palate. When you agitate, this one gets very, very creamy. It's not silky again, but it gets very creamy, and even much more so than the first. It really starts to fill up the volume in your mouth. It's super fine, tight bubbles, so it feels very lush and creamy. So very nice, luscious mouthfeel, very nice standard full medium body to it. It's, it's exactly what I expected there. In terms of the flavor development and the finish, the flavor development on second sip wasn't dissimilar to what I got on first sip, but there was a little more intensity to it. So that yeasty character, that sour tang, that tartness, and that just overall kind of earthy quality, and that's really coming from a combination of hops and the yeast itself, the Kaviak, um, that really was a bit more pronounced. Yes, there is a little bit of citrus elements and there's a slight suggestion on the palate of those tropical fruit, but by and large, this is a lot more earthy and then playing on the Kaviak yeast. So it's got that yeasty quality and it's got that sourness and that tartness. That's really what's coming to the forefront in this beer. In terms of the length of the finish itself, it's not super long. It's not super long at all. Overall, I would say it's average, maybe high end of average. It doesn't really extend out. Even though the bitters are a lot more present on this beer, it doesn't really translate into a super long finish. But it is nice and wet and round. There's no clipping to it. It's not truncated. It's, it's not short, um, you know, in, in terms of what, what happens texturally on the finish. Um, it's just not super long. Really average, maybe high end of average. But in terms of the total package, very interesting beer, very enjoyable beer. This is not your average IPA. This is probably not for everybody, but if you're used to drinking, you know, sour IPAs, well, I wouldn't call this a sour IPA. This has a lot more kind of funky characteristic to it and a lot more yeast. If you've never had a Kaviak beer or been exposed to this yeast strain, it's very unique. You kind of know it when you taste it. Oh yeah, that's a Kaviak. And this in an IPA form, it absolutely works. And then the added oats, it just makes just another dimension there added in. Overall, very strong beer, very enjoyable. I'm gonna take my time, sip on this, go my scores. When we come back, we will get both beers ranked from top to bottom. Okay, now that we've gotten to enjoy both beers, we're gonna get them ranked. Starting with Lupulin Brewing Company's Sophistry, standard IPA 7% on this one. Lupulin is based in Big Lake, Minnesota. This one had a blend of Citra, Yukino, Cryo, Rakao, Galaxy, and Falconer's Flight hops in it. Okay, so starting with the aroma. The aroma on this beer was very, very nice and it was quite pronounced. Certainly uh, above average. I wouldn't say it was exactly top tier. There are some that uh, do a little better job, but I got a really good sense of what to expect before I jumped in the beer. It smelled very, very nice. A lot of different aromas coming through. Um, overall, this one gets an eight out of 10. For the taste, taste was really, really nice on this beer. Uh, this was um, really an interesting blend of hops. It does have some less commonly used in it. And uh, that certainly did go to play into a beer that had quite a few uh, different kind of intensities of the various standard hop flavors. Overall, I enjoyed it and it had a reasonably nice uh, bitter kick to it as well. Uh, again, this one's well above average. It gets an eight out of 10. For the body, the body on this beer was very, very big. 7% ABV on an IPA, that's kind of right smack in the average range, but the body on this was very, very large indeed. It had a lot of breadth to it. It does get a perfect 10 out of 10. Mouthfeel, similar story as with the body. It more or less felt like I expected for an IPA, certainly one in the standard ABV range, but it actually did still have quite a lot more resistance to it than I anticipated and uh, really matched very well with that nice robust body. Mouthfeel gets a 10 out of 10. For the finish, the finish on this one was longer than average, but it wasn't super, super long. Sure, it did have a reasonably nice kick of bitters to it. 
and the flavors that came through were relatively pungent but honestly the pungency and the bittering wasn't quite on the top end to really really extend out that finish it was longer than average though it gets an 8 out of 10. for the head and retention this one did a tremendous job for port at home um, honestly it was one of those that looked like it could have been pulled from a tap gets a perfect 10 out of 10. for the appearance this is textbook what i think of when i think of an ipa it gets a 10 out of 10. for the balance Overall, I like the balance between the hops and the grain bill. Really for me on this, um, sure, it had a reasonably nice bitter kick, but I was craving more bitters. Uh, and I think that would have helped to drum up the intensity of the hop characteristic flavors that came through as well. A lot of that pairs well with that bittering agent in an IPA. And it was above average, but it wasn't top tier. It gets a seven out of 10. Feeling in the intangible. Overall, I enjoyed the beer. Um, Lupulin beers, I've had quite a few now, and they've all been very good. Uh, I thought this one was above average to be certain, but it didn't have that wow factor for me. Really, the wow factor was knowing the hot blend they put in there, getting some that you don't see all that often or very rarely. Uh, but I, you know, it's still an IPA at its heart, and I was still craving more bitters and more intensity on that end. Above average, though, it gets a 7 out of 10. Finally, as an example of the style, as an IPA, this is very, very well done. This one's above average. Uh, it's certainly an IPA that I think a lot of people could enjoy. Uh, the intensity of the bitters was there enough that if you're a hop head, I think you'd still enjoy it, especially for the interesting uh, hop flavor characteristics that came through. But, um, you know, for me, it's, it's still an IPA at its core, and I was craving more bitters. That was really the big takeaway on this one. As delicious as it was, it just needed more intensity of bitters. Uh, but overall, above average, it gets an 8 out of 10, which brings the total score on Lupulin Brewing Company Sophistry to an 86 out of 100. So definitely an above average beer here. Uh, very tasty. If you're not as big of a fan of super hoppy beers, this is probably one you might want to take a look at. Moving on to beer number two. This is Stellwagen Beer Company's We Are Your Oat Verlords, an oat IPA clocking in at 7% ABV. They are based in Marshfield, Massachusetts. It was brewed with Citra, El Dorado, and Raquel hops. And this one had uh, Kaviak yeast that was in it, which uh, was kind of the interesting play in this beer, aside from the oat side of the IPA, that Kaviak yeast. Uh, it's not something you see every day, and first IPA I've ever seen that had it in it. But uh, moving on to the aroma. The aroma on this beer was nice. Um, it smelled more or less like a typical IPA. Uh, you got the typical hop aromas that came through but there was definitely a little underlying something else and i'm certain that came from the kaviak yeast it was a cross between almost a tang and a, and a sour nature but without it being a sour ipa it was interesting and the pungency was above average it gets a seven out of ten for the taste the taste on this beer was fantastic um really it it was the bittering came through very, very well. It was far more bitter than I anticipated, and that Kaviak yeast really added just this extra special layer and dimension to this beer that otherwise wouldn't have had. That said, I was still craving more bitters in this one as well, but overall, very delicious beer. It gets a 9 out of 10. For the body. The body on this beer kind of surprised me. It was above average, but being that it had an oat back to it, that usually does help to add extra breadth to the body and extra thickness to the mouthfeel. This one was above average, but it wasn't over the top. It gets a seven out of 10 for the mouthfeel. Mouthfeel on the other hand, it did exactly what I anticipated. Um, it was significantly more resistant and viscous than your standard average IPA, which 7% yet again, uh, here we are right in that average range. But the oat really did its job. It really lushed up that mouthfeel, added this nice subtle kind of creaminess and voluminous nature to the mouthfeel and tons of resistance there. It gets a perfect 10 out of 10. For the finish, the finish on this beer, I was kind of surprised um, because it didn't really lack a hop presence, uh, but the, the intensities that came through really didn't translate into all that long of a finish. I would say it was on the high end of average, but that's just about it. It gets a six out of 10. For the head and retention, uh, we were two for two with these. This one poured uh, as beautifully as it would have been pulled from a tap at a bar. It gets a 10 out of 10. For the appearance, yet again, textbook IPA appearance is exactly what I expected. It gets a 10 out of 10. For the balance, 
The balance on this beer was really, really quite nice. Granted, they weren't using a tremendously complicated hop bill here. Uh, the oat edition and specifically the Kavia yeast uh, really added some different interesting elements in it. And the way that they balanced all of their ingredients in their bill for this beer out was just beautiful. It had the right amount of Kavia yeast to let that quality come through. It had the right amount of oat to let that quality come through had the right amount of hops to let that come through and still let every independent part have its own voice. It gets a perfect 10 out of 10. Feeling in the intangible. I loved this one. I, I really, really did. A very interesting beer that was executed just masterfully. I gave it a 10 out of 10 subjectively. Finally is an example of the style. Overall, this beer did pretty well. Um, it had a few above average categories and some that were high end of average, but overall it did uh, well across most categories. Taking that into account, um, I do think this beer is well above average, but it was just shy of perfection for me. It gets a nine out of 10, which brings the total score on Stellwagens, we are your overlords, to an 88 out of 100. So only two points apart, an 86 and an 88. Both beers very, very delicious, and both of them uniquely different beer drinking experiences for the IPA lover. Folks, that's today's review. As always, I do sincerely appreciate you tuning in today. Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you want to stay in the loop when our videos go live to YouTube, you just click the notification bell icon. It's right next to the subscribe button. Until next time, keep it beer, keep it craft. We'll see you on the next one. Cheers.